Hello and welcome to Money Matters, our new weekly business show to keep you up to date on the latest in the Hong Kong business environment. The global pandemic has cost the aviation industry 256 billion US dollars in passenger revenue. Travel is down over 60% according to the International Civil Aviation Organization. With air travel predicted to stay at low altitude for another four years, could travel via private jet see a boost once restrictions are lowered? Grounded. More than 95% of private planes are now grounded, and it's not as simple as keeping your car parked. Is there a lot of maintenance needed, especially now that planes have been grounded? We need to, to try all the systems, yeah, the flight control systems, which include the flaps, the ailerons, the rudder. So we need to, to, to function with all the systems, yeah. Same with the landing gears, yeah. So the, the landing gear as well. So every couple of, of months, we also need to put the landing gear up, landing gear down, just to try it, like, to function all the systems. Sergio Oliveira e Silva is managing director for an international private jet company. He says the planes are built for flying, so having them grounded requires lots of maintenance, a service his company provides. So the engineering, the, that part of maintenance is helping us kind of, of the offset the losses, but as you know, we need to fly. So if you don't fly, there's a big impact for everyone. My clients call me every week almost, can I fly now, can I fly now? Normally in a recession, the private jet industry is one of the first affected and the last to recover. But Sergio and others are confident that because they were the last in aviation to be affected by the pandemic, they'll be the first in the industry to recover. They'll be able to travel before commercial routes come back online. When this virus disappears, basically, I believe charter business will be much more popular now, especially for next year because people that have, they can afford, they prefer to, fl to rent a, a charter, a private jet, a jet instead to, to buy a first class ticket on any airline. So that's what we're expecting and I think will happen for sure. In Asia, particularly Hong Kong and China, most who fly private own their planes. A handful of them lease them out when they're not flying, a kind of Airbnb model. Since the pandemic, there has been an increase of inquiries into buying or leasing private jets, according to some operators. We got more than 300% uh, of inquiries um, compared to last year during this two-month period from March to uh, May. Jenny's company manages 45 jets for their owners. Five of them are available to charter when not in use. She says there's a new demographic of people interested in buying their own jet. There are uh, a lot of uh, newcomers uh, uh, and uh, high-tech companies. They're trying to buy planes nowadays. And so uh, now they're thinking for safety issues, for flexibility issues. Um, and really, it just uh, during this COVID period, they need to make sure that the cabin is clean and safe and being uh, disinfected and sanitized. Right now, only 10% of those who can afford to fly private do. Once barriers come down, analysts predict the other 90% will consider it for safety reasons. I had a friend who's in manufacturing business and um, her, her company is doing very well, uh, multi-billion dollar uh, company. And then she told me, she only traveled in economic class uh, before, but now she's thinking to buy a private jet. She said uh, mainly due to safety reasons. Ian Moore, an operator out of Europe, agrees. His fleet, unlike those in Asia, is 100% owned by the company. This means clients can buy flying hours, making it considerably easier and more affordable to fly private. He says he's already in talks with several corporations who are looking at flying their staff privately since there will be less company travel, so more budget to spend on fewer but safer flights. Um, a lot of the corporations we're talking to, they're keen to get their guys back on the road because they feel that they're better face to face than they are through a Zoom call. Uh, and that's just reality. He points out that flying commercial involves far more risk of infection as there are almost 700 touch points versus 40 when flying private. Right. If you think about the whole airport and the, the amount of people that are going through that larger airport, 
all the way through to check-in, going through security, going through boarding and the, the onboard experience and then getting off. Aviation consultant Jeff Lowe says that it's the ultimate in social distancing. You can literally show up 10 minutes before your flight. You go into this dedicated facility, which at this point in time, you'll be the only person in it, okay? Someone from the facility will take your passport. And there's your aircraft parked right there with the air stair door down. You walk up the stairs, they close the door, they taxi out and, and away you go. Regionally, Jeff says China has recovered considerably in private aviation, particularly as it's a huge domestic market. And these are the big markets, uh, the Shanghai, Shenzhen, Guangzhou. Uh, you're only seeing traffic levels down about 30% at the moment. And even there's a few markets that are, are actually back to normal and are higher than they were last year. China, which has gotten back to normal, probably earliest of anybody. But is the sticker price worth it? Based on a seat-to-seat -seat comparison by Ian, he says a flight from Hong Kong to New York via one of his fleet is roughly 50% more expensive than a first-class ticket. Plus, it's rare that every seat in a private jet is taken. So value comes in other ways. It really becomes you know, pretty competitive when a lot of the commercial airlines now can't fly to destinations or you can't get from A to B anymore. You may have to go to A to C to B, and that could take you an extra half a day. The operator-owned business model of Ian's company offers better deals for users since clients can then buy a number of flying hours per year rather than having to buy their own jet or wait for an owner jet to become available. But those in the industry say that until international aviation restrictions between countries in the APAC region are either standardized or come down, this kind of flying won't be available here. The issue we have in Asia is all those third-party charges are extremely expensive out here. And not only extremely expensive, but depending on where you go, they, they vary greatly as well. So the problem in Asia is that you really have a hard time coming up with sort of one size that fits all. He sees potential for the inoculation passports of the 70s returning. These showed if a traveler had been vaccinated for certain diseases, so they would be allowed entry into certain countries. Just as the security increases from 9-11 became permanent, some of the COVID-19 measures could also stay. For now, flying private may remain out of reach for most people, but signs point to a growing trend of travel this way once virus-related restrictions come down. Morningstar says given the escalation of the Sino-American technology war, the Trump administration's expansion of its ban to include not just the WeChat US app, but also Tencent's app too, is the most probable scenario which could affect up to 2% of Tencent's revenue. The next most likely option is to forbid Apple and Alphabet from offering downloads and updates of WeChat in their global app stores, excluding China. This could affect up to 5% of Tencent's revenue. The prickly attitude in Washington could lead to a forced sale of Tencent ownership of several of its games, impacting the company's revenue by 6%. The nuclear option, banning all U.S. companies from doing business with Tencent, both inside and outside of China, is possible but unlikely. Goldman Sachs says it has observed increasing inquiries and interest around investment opportunities in China. China equities more specifically, the reason being the Chinese economy continues to normalize. The risk outlook, lackluster domestic demand, domestic containment and prevention measures for COVID-19 have been effective so far, but unlike a good old lockdown, officials can't seem to get people to part with their save the economy money, please. GSS add to healthcare holdings. Demand growth for testing kits and medical equipment, such as patient monitors and ventilators, was explosive and continues to surge. Pharmacy sales were also boosted by increased demand for personal protective equipment, health supplements, and prescription drugs. Reuters Breaking Views says China's tech-focused star exchange is in danger of losing its focus, as older names eye its fundraising potential. 
Older names like Karmic Ugjili wants to raise 3 billion US. A surge of mature companies chasing stratospheric valuations on venues built for earlier stage firms is becoming a thing. Beijing wants to help smaller, cash-strapped techish companies raise equity. But obviously, Geely hopes to goose its valuations just like chipmaker SMIC did when it debuted at 109 times 2019 earnings. Alibaba-backed Ant Group is eyeing the same setup. Does Geely match the bleeding-edge profile of these tech titans? Sure, if you include satellite radio as standard. Up next, look at the expat rental market in Hong Kong and how prices in upscale areas are coming down because of the slow economy. Welcome back. Over the years, Hong Kong has attracted many expats working for global multinational companies. These companies are willing to pay for their high-priced housing. But as the coronavirus pandemic shatters the world's economy, even the biggest firms are starting to tighten budgets. As a result, rents in some traditional luxury areas like the mid-levels are sinking. Reporter Alice Khan asks how far down the downside is. Mid-Levels is a traditional high-end residential area that has been favored by expats for years. Henk Jan Palmster came from Amsterdam three years ago. He's a director for a German plastics company. He's lived in the Mid-Levels ever since he arrived in Hong Kong. Henk pays a monthly rent of $32,000 for a flat on Robinson Road, which he thinks is too much. He's on a flat hunt for a bargain in Mid-Levels. We are not a huge company, so we try to keep the cost reasonable. Location, price, they are important factors in my choice where I would want to live. Price-wise, rents for a new residential unit in this area can fetch as high as $100,000 a month. Property consultants think a lot of expats won't be able to afford it amid a slowing economy. For most of the executives, uh, just like in the investment bank, their average salary income may be around $80,000 to $100,000 per month. So excluding all the expatriate compensation or the package. Before, they may have another, say, $50,000 or $30,000 subsidies for the accommodation. But right now, most of the companies will cut down their, say, accommodation package or their subsidies. So you can imagine that if you would like to hire a flat in the mid-levels, normally you will pay at least, say, 40000 to a three-bedroom unit, which is about 80000 per month. So you can see that most of the expats, they cannot afford such accommodation costs. In this episode, we help expats like Hank look for a bargain in this area. The first property we visit is a furnished unit in this six-year-old building on Kane Road. The building is relatively new in this area. It's a one-bedroom unit. Net size is 305 square feet. The floor-to-ceiling curtain wall in the living room allows natural light to filter into the room. The landlord offers a TV and a sofa in the living room. It has a balcony which allows natural airflow into the unit. As the unit is on the middle floor, it enjoys an open view. It also has a bit of a sea view as well. The wide glass panel of the bedroom also makes it look larger. The color theme of the bedroom is violet. As the landlord targets Western expats, he includes a double bed fitted to Western physiques. There's a wardrobe on the other side of the room, but as it's small, there's not much room to move around. The open kitchen is right next to the entrance. It's small, but equipped with all the necessary devices. We have a bar table here, and we have a uh, electric cooking. We have a, a washing and dry here. And also we have a fridge here. The landlord also renovated the bathroom. The drawbacks of this unit is insufficient storage room. It's only fit for one person, not for a family. The landlord was asking $30,000 a month, but now it's down to $27,000. This apartment were empty like about like two months. Because of the lockdown, like the expat were, were less coming and working in central and the environment right now. So most likely not much people were renting this one bedroom at the moment now. 
So like the, the landlord just dropped 10 10 off, see if uh, they can get, they can rent another apartment quicker. The building also offers facilities for tenants. We have a reading room, a gym, a swimming pool, and we have a, a sky garden at the top floor. And compared with the old building, they don't have those things. That's why the rental actually is included, plus those facility like gym things. So the tenant can use like if they want to use it, but not with the old building. That's why the rental between the old building and new building, they have a little gap for it. So our next stop is a bigger unit in this older building on the same street. The net size of this unit is 552 square feet with two bedrooms. Shouldn't a bigger unit charge higher rent? Actually, the landlord slashed the rent significantly from $34,000 down to $26,000. Generally, it's across the board for both older and newer buildings. It's around 10% of the existing rental. We've also seen um, tenants who are still living in their places asking for rent reductions. Um, so it's not just for new leases that we're seeing those reductions. Yeah. But again, it's generally 10 to 20% off the, their current rentals because landlords want to keep the tenants rather than them moving out. The unit is not furnished. The living room is spacious. The rectangular shape of the unit makes it easier to fit furniture. There are lots of cabinets in the open kitchen. It has two bedrooms. This master bedroom is over 60 square feet. The agent says the efficiency is 90% in an older building compared to just 60% in a new building. Sonia, how is this building? This building is, uh, was built in 1972, so, it sh it, so we have good efficiency in the older buildings. So this is the master bedroom, so you can see it's very good size. You can easily fit a king-size bed here with a headboard here and we have some built-in wardrobes. They've been quite clever with the sliding doors so that you can fit a bigger bed in. Um, so with the newer buildings, you wouldn't be able to get bedrooms of this size and to be able to walk around three sides. The smaller bedroom is around 50 square feet. A double bed can fit into the space. The drawbacks are that the view is only of the building's opposite. There's not enough natural light, so tenants may need to turn on the light even in the daytime. Privacy may also be an issue because it's quite close to the other buildings. Also, the interior seems old and the building doesn't have any leisure facilities. People who move into these older buildings, they want the space, it's not the facilities. The Europeans and the Americans, they don't mind the older buildings and they prefer to have the larger rooms and the bigger space. They're used to having the bigger rooms, whereas people living in Asia are used to the small spaces, so they don't mind the smaller rooms, um, and, but they prefer the newer fittings. Hank looked at both units. Which one does he prefer? Hank agrees the new unit has a nice view, but he prefers the older one. That's very reasonable compared to last year uh, for a unit like this. Uh, because 426, I think, 426 for Cane Road, I would prefer the space, uh, this one. I prefer the space over uh, it being very new. Here you've got more luggage space, more living space, very useful kitchen, good appliances, good countertop. Uh, good space for a dining table. The two bedrooms both can fit a good sized bed and fit a cabinet space. The Pierre is, everything is very compact. So you have a very small kitchen. Also the bedrooms, the, the bed is very tightly built in with quite a small cabinet. Hank says the furnished unit would fit expats who are new to Hong Kong. Location wise, he likes Cane Road because it's convenient. You take the escalator down, in 10 minutes you are in the city where you can do your shopping, meet people. Convenient, you have everything on your doorstep. You never need to go far for anything, whether it's your shops or your supermarkets, but also restaurants where you eat. Vincent Jung believes rent will go back up again next year. A lot of experts are still stay in the overseas countries. 
But I believe that after uh, uh, the release of the travel restriction, maybe in the early last, next year, so more experts will come back to Hong Kong and then the, uh, the rental uh, situations uh, will be improved, especially for the uh, properties at the mid-levels. Floating Cinema has launched a brand new experience for moviegoers in London, aiming to help bring the city's film industry back to life. The Float In Cinema cast off in early September, requiring the audience to be on boats. On Regent's Canal in central London, over 100 moviegoers float in, moor up, and watch the stars on Britain's biggest ever riverside screen, listening through noise-canceling headphones. Anyone suffering from seasickness is taken to the dock. In line with government guidance groups of up to six people from different households can take part. We're here to like celebrate Maria's birthday and Maria has like parents that are, were shielding so we were like well this is going to be the safest way to do it for Maria. It's just a comfortable way I think that we all feel safe as well and um, we feel like we can still spend time together and make memories in such a unique way. Cinemas across the UK were allowed to reopen in July with social distancing rules and face masks. Organizers responded to the ordeal, saying they had no choice but to get creative. Talk about peer pressure. From March, our revenue as a production company dropped by about 95%. So um, we, uh, it's, our industry has been, has been hit really hard, so it's all about everyone now pivoting and coming up with new ideas, new ways of doing things. There are worries, though, that as winter approaches, outdoor events like this will be hit by worsening weather at 12 two and six. After 13 years, a South Florida city has overturned a ban on saggy pants. You might call them London Bridge trousers since they keep falling down. The Opaloka City Commission voted four to one to repeal both the original 2007 law and a 2013 ordinance that said girls too could receive tickets for wearing pants that exposed their undergarments. That's a pants down victory. Many residents felt the madness could have been avoided if the wearers had sported camouflage pants. Then you'd never have seen those waistbands droop. Others thought the law targeted a certain segment of the population, young African-American men. The Civil Liberties Union of Florida called it a ridiculous waste of public resources. In the end, no lawsuits were filed. Ahem. If only the geniuses in government could pass a law to deal with the sagging coronavirus hit economy, that'd be a suitable ending. That's Money Matters for tonight. Join us next week when we flat test a place in Lohas Park to look at the quality of its design and construction. Thanks for joining us. Good night.